and Francis was like, you know, he was an awesome guy. He he'd seen me. I used to go to I I saw Muddy Waters. I Some of you might like to know a little bit more about uh, our drummer. Now going back to 40 years of Chick Webb. His drummer right is okay to say drummer. Pounding his pulsing beat into the hearts of all America. You do your kind of drumming, and I'll do my kind of drumming. I have no more say. You don't want to work with it. Now back to Jim Cooper's syncopated style, shortly. Get up there behind those drums, lean back, close your eyes, get right on the groove there, give it a good steady beat. I'm a blessed I'm a vision! How'd you hit that? I'm in New York City with Albert Bouchard. Al, thanks for doing this. Oh, no, my pleasure. No problem. So, uh, let's talk about, I, I read that you worked with Chuck Berry. Oh yeah, Early yeah, on. yeah. That was a great, uh, cool experience. Um, I mean, I you know, I wish I had a whole bunch of Chuck Berry stories, but it really, it's just that one story. We uh, the first night that we played with them, we played two nights. The first night, uh, we got there early, you know, uh, we got to do a sound check, you know, and so we go in and we check, and then we play, we play through our set. And no, still no Chuck, you know, he doesn't show up. He shows up like, you know, maybe half an hour before the show, you know. And how it was going to work was we got to play a set of our material, and then Chuck came out and we played, you know, a set of Chuck's material. And then B.B. King was the closer. So, um, so he comes... He get, comes on stage and he says, listen, you guys know all my songs. We don't have to go over any of these songs. You, everybody knows my songs, right? I mean, you do know my songs. I mean, you've listened to them, right? And he says, I'm not going to do anything weird. I'm going to do all the stuff that's on the record. You know, uh, he says, uh, and, uh, but a drummer, drummer. And he looks at me and he says, uh, who's the drummer? I'm sitting on the drums. I'm like, I am. He goes, okay, drummer, listen, here's, here's what you got to do. When I raise my guitar up and then I bring it down, you got to stop. But don't stop the beat in your head, okay? Keep the beat going because I'm just going just gonna to stop for a minute and then we're going to take it right back up. I said, I got it, Chuck. I said, you mean like uh, no particular place to go? He goes, yeah, just like that. Okay. I said, do you want to do it? He goes, nah, just remember that. He says, the other thing is that when I, when I swing my left foot out or my right foot out to the side and I bring it in to my, uh, into my other foot, that means wrap it up. Give me an ending. Nice. I said, okay. And then he, he says, one other thing, the bass player, bass player. Uh, and the bass player goes, yeah, yeah, Chuck. And he goes, um, or yeah, Mr. Barry, you know, whatever. But uh, he goes, uh, when we played Memphis, Play it the Johnny Rivers way. Don't play it my way. I hate that bass line. Interesting. <laughs> he says, you mean like, and he's play something. He goes, no, 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 no. Just one note. Just play the root note. That's it. Root note. Okay. So, anyway, it was fun. We played two nights, and then we got fired. What, what happened there? We were supposed to play four nights, but um, the, the club owner... At, well, here's what happened is we played the set with Chuck Berry. It was awesome. I mean, to me, it was like he was the best singer I'd ever played with. He, he, his voice was so loud. He was so commanding. He had the audience laughing. He was like, he was just amazing. And he also, he did a song that the audience went crazy for called My ding a -Ling. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, it was not recorded yet. He hadn't recorded it. He recorded it like six months later. But it had the audience participation. It, yeah, it had that whole yeah. thing, and the people loved it. And, I, and he goes, that's, that's a good song. i got to record that. So, And it turned out to be his biggest hit. But um, uh, 
So uh, after the and we we stayed and watched BB King because I'd seen BB, you know, play at the Fillmore and a, a couple other venues where it was really big and you know he was far away. But this was like intimate club right up close, and we got to be like almost on stage with him. So it was pretty cool, and and I knew the drummer. Okay, it was this guy Francis Clay because he played with Muddy Waters and and we we'd done a show with Muddy Waters. And Francis was like, you know, he was an awesome guy. He he'd seen me. I used to go to. I I saw Muddy Waters. I don't know five or six times. What, what year was that? This well, when I out. was okay, when we played with uh, B, B, with uh, Chuck Berry, that was 1968. In 1966 is when I first started going to see. In the fall of '66, I went to, down to the city to see Chuck Berry play. I mean, um, Muddy Waters. Muddy Waters play. And uh, and there was this group called the Blues Project that played with them, so I wanted to see them too. And uh, and then later, on, you know, throughout the year in '66 and then '67, I was going down to the city to from upstate where I'm from to to uh, catch different blues shows. And I'd seen uh, Muddy Waters a few times, and it was always, you know, yeah, we're gonna have a jam afterwards, and so I'd hang around hang around till like five in the morning and then you know and they'd still be jamming and I'd just get discouraged and leave you know so anyway so Francis Clay recognized me from you know one of the guys that wanted to play his drums right so he said hey man you know you finally on the bill with us we guess we guess we get to play together I'm like yeah cool he goes yeah you met mud right you know mud I go no I don't know him. you know I never met him he goes oh come on let me introduce you to Mud. So he brings me over to Muddy Waters, and he goes, Muddy, this is my son, Albert. <laughs> He's another drummer. Oh, yeah, yeah. And he, he gave me a great advice. You know, he said, you know, the main thing about playing drums is having good posture. Keep your shoulders up. You know, be proud to play the drums. Play proud. Nice. You know, and you can hear it on Thrill is Gone. You can hear that, that proud thing that he's doing, you know, because then, you know, Six months later, he was playing with B.B. King. He'd recorded Thrill is Gone, and Billy B.B. had stolen him from Muddy, I guess. Or Muddy let him go, I'm sure. Right. And Muddy said, okay, you, you do your thing, man. So, so anyway, so after B.B. King played, uh, um, Jimi Hendrix came in. Now, as a just... Just, he was in the audience. Hanging out. Just hanging out, you know. I mean, I'm watching B.E. Kane. I look Where over was there. This, by the way? It was a club called Generation, which now is known at the same site, the same building is called Electric Ladyland. Because Hendrix liked it so much, he bought it and turned it into a recording studio. So, but before it was a recording studio, it was a club called Generation. It lasted maybe a month tops, you know. And this was the second week. Okay, it was packed too. So, you know, and he had uh, he had Chuck Berry and BB King for four nights. We were not on the bill. <laughs> we were just like the backup band, you know. So, uh, but we did get to play our set for two nights. And then, but so what happened was, so uh, Jimi Hendrix was there, and a bunch of the guys from Paul Butterfield, Elvin Bishop was there. And Mike Bloomfield wasn't there, but there was Elvin Bishop, there was the bass player, I can't remember his name. It, the drummer, Sam Lay was in jail at that time, so it wasn't Sam playing drums, but it was some other guy, Davenport, I think. The drummer was there. So they're playing, we're watching, you know, but we've got to get back to Long Island because we it's like a two-hour drive back to where we, we came from. And then because we've got to get back the next day at a reasonable hour so so we stayed till about five in the morning you know and then we we got back on the expressway and went out to long island they were still playing when we left right so we come in the next afternoon right at about five o'clock and uh saturday and um my hi-hat is broken it's completely broken the standard the 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 pedal where the pedal connects to the rod yeah it was broken. It sheared off. Okay. And then we go to turn on the amps, and the amps don't work. They all had blown fuses. I'm like, what the hell? 
what are these guys doing? They're, you know, it's Jimi Hendrix, and you know, so so we go to the club owner. He, Listen, you got to help us. You know, you, you must have some gear. He says, No, I don't have any gear back there. You know, it's only the second week. We don't have any. We don't have any gear here. So we said, Oh, well, uh, we got stuff that's broken. You know, he said, Oh, it's not my problem. You guys got to better get it together before Chuck gets here. So I'm like, Oh, okay. So we run out. We, uh, you know, I went. There was actually a pawn shop down the street where I bought a new hi hat, and then uh, it turned out that all we needed was fuses for the for the amps. We replaced the fuses, and they were they work fine. So that night, after BB King plays. The club owner comes and says, listen, Al Cooper is here with blood, sweat, and tears. They want to sit in. And we said, uh, well, they can't use our equipment unless each person who's going to use it comes over and talks to us. Because we'd already, you know, you know, one of the guys said, hey, what do you want to do? You know, they want to use my amp. I, I don't feel like letting them use it. And we said, listen, let the person who's going to use your amp come over and talk to you. And at least they'll have a sense of responsibility for the equipment. You know, and as long as they talk to you, you know, we're, you know, they can use the stuff. So, so we told him he got all grumpy, you know, and then next thing you know, Bobby Columbi, you know, Bobby, you know, drummer from Blood, Sweat and Tears, he's talking to me and we're talking, he's telling stories. Bobby's an amazing guy, really funny. And had you known him? Before? No, I never met him before, but our paths would cross many times after that, you know. I mean, he was when Blue Oyster Cult auditioned. Clive Davis, right? He was there. He was, you know. Clive had two, three advisors: Bobby Columbi, who was the main guy, his music guy, and then he had uh, Harry Nielsen, who was just a sweetheart of a guy, and then he had Patty Smith, who was going out with our keyboard player. So those three were there. They were they were there play? when we were auditioning for just. Those three and Clive, that was it. Interesting. You know, and this is after we'd auditioned for all the for all the the shirts, you know, all the suits, you know. We right. we'd already done that, gotten through that, and Clive wanted a personal audition. So and then and I, of course I saw Bobby there, and I'm like, ah, we got this, <laughs> we got this. Bobby, how you doing? Yeah, man? yeah, exactly, <laughs> Bobby. Oh. My. Oh my God, you know, he's like, yeah, yeah, and he, Bobby, let him. You guys your really got your shit together, you know. Yeah. Uh, so. But, uh, and then, you know, over the years, I've seen it many times, so. Great. All right, so wait, wait, because this this is all good stuff, and we're going to get back to that audition story, but okay. just to finish the Chuck Berry, so. So, so, blood, sweat, and tears, you used our equipment, played, sounded great, awesome, and uh, <laughs> we get back there the next afternoon, and there's another band playing, you know, rehearsing on stage, and our equipment is over on the side, and the guy goes, you're fired. You give us, you give, you give, nobody gives me a hard time by using the equipment. Interesting. So, but, you know. It was all the club owner. Yeah. And then, and then you know, three weeks later, club was closed. We're like, ha, ha. So there. Last laugh. Yeah. <laughs> so this was a pickup band situation that, that shot. Yeah, it, yeah, yeah, That's exactly. Just, yeah, yeah. And how did you guys get the gig from the club manager? No, no, it was from through our, our manager, who was Sandy Proman, who was uh, Sandy, um, well, go back farther, when I was in college, when I was coming down to the city to see Chuck Berry, we would stop and, you know, stop at a, a store and, you know, get buy some cigarettes or whatever, it was back in the days when I smoked, and, uh, and we picked up a magazine called Crawdaddy. Daddy, which was, uh, and it was supposed to be about music. So we read the magazine. We're like, oh, this is the stupidest magazine we've ever seen, you know. And these guys, you know, they, they're trying to be all intellectual about rock and roll, you know, this is ridiculous. So in in sixty in late 67, when I finally moved to the city, who's the first guy I meet? A, one of the writers for Crawdaddy, this guy, Sandy Perlman. And and Perlman was he was connected to all kinds of people. He was connected to the he was the president of the student activities board at Stony Brook, and so his best friend was the was the next president the the president in 1967 who hired all the bands, everybody from you know from the local band to play the mixer to you know the Jefferson Airplane or the Grateful Dead or whatever. So and Stony Brook had amazing concerts back in those days. So so that's how we got our start was through Sandy 
uh, and his friends, and he booked us everywhere. He booked us at uh, Stony Brook, and then by